process, and uh, uh, I think we have a lot of secular words for this too. The shock of wreck example, when um, you read, as maybe we will tomorrow morning, a, a passage from uh, from our current sample, which describes uh, the uh, a hot day, being inside of a, a room at the seashore with the light coming in, and just hearing distant sounds and so forth. Seems to me that's something which can very easily speak to people and have a and and uh, involve a shock of recognition, but which we wouldn't normally tend to describe in Ricoeur's terms. Well, no doubt there too, when uh, when a text uh, means something strongly, uh, we would need for a theory of interpretation. We need a word like that, and I think that can also be connected to um, to Heidegger's uh, idea about language as being. Uh, a medium of deconcealment, that is, a, the, that the specificity of language is that a text, that language can also not mean anything. That is, it can, that isn't to say that it's nonsense, but that it's, it can remain a dead letter for us. We can read, we can read it, in fact, we do read a great many texts which we understand in all kinds of literal ways, but that mean nothing, you know, and all of a sudden, uh, maybe later on one of those texts suddenly becomes alive and then begins to mean something in a very special way, or maybe a, a different text does. And it's at that point, I think, that one is faced with this, um, with this phenomenon which occurs, calling kerygma, and which I think, uh, of which I think more secular versions can be made. I don't, but I think with that I'm going to uh, postpone further discussion of the whole question of interpretation and hermeneutics until much later because I think we've begun that, uh, that theme and I don't want to come back to it until we have a lot more material in the way of these readings and, and, and other things. Other, so other questions that, that people might, uh, that, was a, that was a question really that people did ask. I've re-asked it for them. Anything else that, that people would like to bring up from last time? Okay, well at any rate, perhaps uh, in future sessions you would keep in mind uh, that, uh, that it might be desirable to, to, to raise some of these things uh, and that it might be very useful for everyone, in other words, to raise some of these things which might otherwise uh, tend to get lost. Okay, now today what I want to do, uh, I think uh, we're probably all uh, impatient with Foucault and want to finish off with him, so I'd like to do that. Uh, I want to, um, in these two sessions today, that is this afternoon and tomorrow morning, raise issues which I think are very, um, are uh, in some way the same issue, although they apply to two different texts. That is to say, they have to do with history, with the writing of history, uh, with, uh, uh, with historiography, with uh, the problems involved in that, with the but historiography is, is not the right word because that supposes that that's an easy thing to do and that's an activity, specialized activity that someone does when they are professional historians and go about their business. Rather, I want to set it up as a problem, that is how one could put history into writing and, uh, what, uh, and what form uh, that would take, would have to take, what forms it might take and, and so on. Uh, therefore, the relationship between history and, um, and, uh, and narrative in, in, in several ways. And I'm going to use Foucault's latest book, next to the latest book, um, Surveille et Punir, uh, I guess you could translate that, Surveillance and Punishment, uh, the book on prisons, uh, as, a, uh, as an example of this. And I'm going to use uh, the order of things as part of the background now for talking about this book which, above and beyond, it's very great interest in itself, in what it says, and all kinds of new information that it has for us, or new interpretations that it has for us about prisons, uh, I'm essentially going to deal with as a text, that is, as a, as a literary object, which uh, tries to put something down on paper, namely history, so it tries to put into language, uh, into writing, uh, something uh, which we have to call history, and I'm going to deal with it then as a... Um, uh, as, a, as a problem of the, of the uh, uh, placing in form, if you like, of, of, uh, of history. I also, um, I also, at the end of this session, would like to say something, so if you, if I begin to get close there without, um, and, and I'm not paying attention, if someone would remind me that, uh, I'd like to say a little <coughs> something about um, the Adorno-Horkheimer, uh, which is no doubt difficult and in some ways more difficult than, than these things uh, uh, and put that in a certain kind of framework which I think will make it a little more uh, accessible too since that's what we'll be, be talking about essentially um, 
essentially next um, uh, next time. Okay. Uh, now, meanwhile, we do have some other themes that uh, that I don't want to lose sight of, although they won't be uh, they won't be dealt with completely today. We I think may have begun in some way uh, last time by talking about levels to talk about the problem of mediations. That I think will be. Um, uh, will be something which comes up again uh, today in, in, uh, in a very specific form in this historical narrative of Foucault about prisons. Uh, there is the question still of the subject, uh, whatever that may be, and although we're not going to deal with that in any great um, uh, detail today either, that's at least a very essential ingredient both in the second part of the order of things and also in the Adorno Horkheimer, so I want to say something about that. Uh, and finally, I don't want to lose sight of the question of um, ideology and of the nature of ideological analysis. That is, uh, what, uh, what essentially, uh, what uh, is, um, what kind of ideological analysis, uh, what kind of method uh, is, uh, can be um, disengaged or found in, uh, in these works of Foucault? Are they, uh, are they in one form or another? a type of ideological analysis, uh, or uh, the other way around, do they have something to tell us about ideological analysis? It turns out that these, both of these things are, are the case, and that's what I would like to begin with um, uh, today. Uh, I'm going to very briefly say a little bit more about the, about the end of this book, or the second half of the, of the order of things, uh, in, in order uh, to sort of finish off our discussion and then go on to, the, go on to this other text. Uh, you remember that I said that um, looked at from the end of the book, this was a kind of uh, immense pamphlet directed against a lot of things. Uh, one way of seeing this pamphlet, um, uh, although from the beginning of the book it looks like a, looks like a history, uh, one way of, of talking about that pamphlet is in terms of the famous um, uh, attack on humanism uh, of Althusser, and I read you Foucault's equivalent, I think, last time, the, the, the death of man. Uh, and we put that uh, in a certain framework, which was uh, an attack on, um, uh, on a certain uh, type of uh, individualism, on, on, on a kind of level of political ideology, uh, an attack on, uh, in a much more thoroughgoing way, on the whole conception of the human or of the individual as an intelligible field of study uh, on the level of, um, of the, the human sciences. Uh, and of course, uh, on, the on the psychoanalytic level, uh, it's a question then of the, um, of the subject uh, by which um, is meant, um, well, the, the ambiguity of the term is that it's not clear whether when you, when you use the subject and you attack, for example, philosophies of the subject, you mean by that that the subject is the ego, the personality, uh, is a kind of fictive entity uh, in which we tend to believe, uh, but which can be shown to be a, a kind of optical illusion uh, of, of, uh, of, of human experience rather than a, a constituting a part of it. Or whether you mean uh, that there really was that there that there really is such a thing that consciousness uh, at a certain moment in history uh, becomes something like a subject, and that uh, that this is a a real event. Uh, when we talk about the constitution of the bourgeois subject, for example, um, it would seem that both of these things are true. That is, on the one hand, we mean that people began to think of their own experience and their consciousness in a different way than they had before. We talk about um, uh, we, we, we tend to see pre-capitalist societies in terms of great, great quantities of people. Uh, Hegel tells us so that, that uh, or, or, or even Marx's version in, in his section on Orient Despotism, that that um, uh, that some of the, that, that some of the ancient societies, either the Roman Empire or Oriental Despotism, uh, have only a single subject because they have a mass of of, uh, of individuals uh, for whom the only existent uh, genuinely human subject is an emperor or a priest king or whatever uh, whose function is to uh, to represent uh, the, the human subject for all these other um, larval uh, kind of swarming uh, uh, masses of, of, uh, of living living organisms uh, 
so sometimes we tend to think in those terms uh, in a kind of uh, pop history that um, that really um, the individual as such uh, is a is a Western um, uh, is a Western uh, thing and and um, uh, is a Western invention. Uh, uh, and as such, uh, if it isn't exactly coeval with, uh, with capitalism, is certainly uh, very closely linked to the practice of commerce. That is to say, uh, you, w you may want to say that ancient Greece is, is also a place in which, in a certain way, this, this uh, autonomous subject came into being and then, and then went out of being again. But this has to be uh, very closely related to, um, to the um, to the development of, of commerce, money, and things like that in, 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 classical, um, in classical Greece. So sometimes we talk about this as though um, really some substantive constitutional change took place in human experience or in the structure of human experience. And then at other times we tend to think of it uh, uh, as being merely a question of the way people think about their experience. And no doubt these two things are very hard to or to separate. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, that's much of the ambiguity of the, the theme of the subject as it, run, as it will run through all these works uh, comes, from, comes from this. Uh, and this is why, again, Foucault is very difficult to, um, uh, to pin down because uh, the end of man that he, uh, that he salutes and welcomes would certainly seem to be, um, uh, would, would, would seem to claim the disappearance of this older individualism, the end of these older uh, kinds of autonomous uh, subjects, which uh, used to be um, a part and parcel of the uh, of the legitimation of our of our society, uh, so that that would be then a real historical transformation in um, in in the nature of life, the disappearance of a whole form of form of existence. Uh, and this feeling gets even stronger, as you'll see uh, later on in, um, in the uh, Deleuze uh, Guattari um, anti-Oedipus. Anti uh, on the other hand, remember that uh, he's only talking about epistemology. So essentially, this argument about the, um, about the subject uh, is, um, uh, is really an argument about the presuppositions of our sciences and at that point, uh, suddenly it looks as though he's not heralding some transform a mutation of human existence at all, but he's only saying that nowadays um, uh, the, uh, the dependence of the various, uh, that the, the, the human sciences have been shown to be um, ideologies essentially, and uh, the dependence of our newer forms of knowledge, which are, as you recall, linguistics, psychoanalysis, and ethnology, uh, can somehow do without this, um, this uh, support, this kind of um, very feeble uh, or, or, uh, or uh, insubstantial presupposition, which is the idea of man, of a, of a kind of uh, hum subject, uh, um, subject organized uh, human life. Uh, now with Adorno and Horkheimer, you'll see that uh, something of the same Ambiguity is present, although one of the things that they're, they're talking about in the, the first chapters of the Dialectic of Enlightenment is precisely the formation of the subject. Uh, that is how out of tribal society uh, something like uh, a, um, a subject emerges and for them this will, be, uh, this will be coeval with the emergence of philosophical reason. So that uh, one speaks about uh, a subject, a, 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 a psychological subject, uh, in, um, or at least one uses as the, as the index of the existence of the psychological subject uh, something like the exercise um, of, uh, of, of reason. We'll come back to that later. Um, so at any rate, this second part of Foucault uh, certainly seems to be making, uh, again, a kind of ambiguous uh, statement about this, um, uh, about this um, process, but I think that um, uh, this ambiguity is even, goes even further than, uh, than the one I just mentioned. Uh, on the one hand, he seems to be taking a position outside of the sciences, uh, which is that of this, what he's going to call this archaeology of, of knowledge. Uh, one, therefore, which is apparently 
kind of neutral, doesn't have to be justified, uh, and uh, from which he therefore is entitled to make judgments as to uh, the um, as to the solidity of knowledge involved in either uh, in in the human sciences or uh, in these other uh, in these other sciences. So this is certainly a kind of ideological critique. That is, it seems to me that from this point of view, uh, it's very clear that Foucault uh, is saying, although he doesn't use these terms in this way, uh, that what we think of as the human sciences um, and uh, and the various kinds of um, scientific legitimation we, we 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 put in these things, these are all essentially uh, not not really. They have no claim. They can make no claim to scientific validity. Uh, they are, therefore, merely a set of ideologies which have come into being to buttress uh, the, uh, they've come into being, as you recall, I don't know uh, whether I drew this, did I draw this picture before or the, the other time? They've come into being, as you remember, between, in the, in the, in the places, in the empty spaces between these three branches of, uh, of knowledge, which are the breakdown places of the classical epistemy. We had uh, grammar here. Grammar, which will give way to language. Um, natural history, which will give way to life, the vital of the figure. And finally, uh, the analysis of riches or wealth, which will give way to um, labor or work. Now the point about these new uh, these new entities, which are no longer really parallel to each other anymore, except insofar as um, except insofar as they are um, uh, have all become objects closed in on themselves and no longer part of this transparency of the uh, of the older type of knowledge. Uh, th these um, insofar as each of these has become relatively autonomous. They all prolong themselves. I'm trying to avoid Foucault's images, but it's very hard. There's a whole imagery of this book, which is one of the things we're going to want to talk about a little bit in terms of how this history is a narrative. Uh, they all, uh, as they prolong their individual existence, reach a kind of uh, no man's land in which they seem to require some basis or some, some uh, philosophical uh, uh, underpinning. And this underpinning is then, is then um, provided by the emergence in between these things of what will now be called the human sciences. Now, the human sciences, uh, as he points out, um, let's see if I can find the page in your text here. The human sciences are essentially um, matters of representation. That is, uh, in... Um, uh, here we deal with work and production, but the human science that corresponds to this science is, are things like sociology, uh, political science, which have to do with the representations we make of work and production. Right? So that's a very different, we're leaving uh, an area which is felt to be uh, a, a place of being, uh, and we're moving into a much more, uh, uh, a much more uncertain uh, area, which is the human, uh, which is the, the representation that people have, the ideas people have about, uh, about this kind of being. Uh, the same is true uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the life sciences. Uh, that, is, uh, that is to say, psychology. The life sciences have to do with that ultimate being, which is the living, whereas psychology only analyzes uh, what uh, impressions, uh, uh, mental forms, and so on correspond to, this, uh, uh, to, to these various experiences. Uh, and finally, uh, to language, to the, to, to, the, to the very being of language itself, corresponds to the, the various human sciences of culture, that is, uh, what we think about language, about the languages that we produce, what, uh, what representations we make of, uh, uh, of language, and so on. All of this seems to me to be very, uh, very exciting, in fact, uh, the, the, way these, the way these are sorted out. Uh, on, on, the one, on the other hand, I'm going to quote a section here from uh, 
Um, this is page 352 of the order of things. Uh, there will be no science of man unless we examine the way in which individuals or groups represent to themselves the partners with whom they produce or exchange, that is sociology, uh, the mode in which they clarify or ignore or make this function, the position they occupy in it, the manner in which they represent to themselves the society in which it takes place, the way in which they feel themselves integrated with it or isolated from it, dependent, subject, or free. The object of the human sciences is not that man who since the dawn of the world or the first cry of his golden age is doomed to work. It is that being who from within the forms of production by which his whole existence is governed forms the representations of those needs of the society by which, with which, or against which he satisfies them, and so on and so forth. Now, much the same thing uh, is said uh, later than about, um, about these other things. I might read some of this. Page 355 to 356. Um, uh, thus, one could admit that the psychological region, that would be in here. I don't know which side to put these on. They, they sort of surround these areas, I guess. Uh, the psychological region has found its locus in that place where the living being, in the extension of its functions, in its neuromotor blueprints, its physiological regulations, but also in the suspense that interrupts and limits them, the break, opens itself to the possibility of representation. Uh, and finally, lastly, in that region where the laws and forms of a language hold sway, but where, nevertheless, they remain on the edge of themselves, enabling man to introduce into them the play of his representations, in that region arise the study of literature and myths, the analysis of all oral expressions and written documents, in short, the analysis of the verbal traces that a culture or an individual may leave uh, behind them. Uh, okay, now, um, uh, therefore, we seem to have here a kind of, uh, in, in one way, a new model for, um, for ideological analysis which challenges these, the, the, the validity of these so-called human sciences on the basis of a complete description of the episteme of a period. That is, uh, it's, uh, and, and in a moment you'll see that uh, this corresponds very closely to uh, these, these no man's land, these, these, um, uh, these intermediary zones, these, uh, these, uh, these zones of, of representation, uh, I think in a, in a very kind of distant way that corresponds very much to what Althusser himself calls ideology. That is uh, the way uh, this kind of an zone of, of, of everyday life which is not uh, with which sciences have to break, which is an area of, uh, in which uh, representation is, uh, is dominant uh, and so forth. Now the point is not only that in, this, uh, in, in these areas no kind of hard knowledge is possible precisely because representation or ideology can't yield anything solid like that. Uh, but the point is also that we're somehow uh, trapped in, in, this, um, uh, in this system. So there's a kind of closure involved in this too. Uh, in other words, the, the judgment, uh, the, if we want to see Foucault as, a, as an analyst of ideology, we would say that uh, this judgment that he's making on the human sciences is twofold. One, uh, it's an attack on the, um, the, the, the constitutional insubstantiality of these, uh, of these areas. And two, it has, it has something to do with the way in which it's impossible to get out of them. That is, the way in which our whole um, mode of thinking the whole, the whole structure of the episteme that we're caught in in this particular period uh, makes it impossible uh, to evolve a, an alternative to these things. And the very project of evolving an alternative only uh, m makes us sink even deeper into the, into the morass of the, of the situation itself. That is, let's say that you found out um, uh, that, uh, that you followed with interest, you were a psychologist, you followed with interest Foucault's uh, description of the, the lack of scientific uh, uh, foundation of psychology, uh, and thereby you set, you set out uh, to retransform the basis of psychology and make it into a science. But that's, you see, impossible in terms of this model, because psychology can never be a science in, in terms of this model. All you can do is evolve a kind of opposite uh, to, 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 to what already exists in the psychological realm, but that will still come into existence somewhere in here. 
now, in fact, uh, the other very interesting thing about his description of this, and then we'll, we'll leave all this, about his description of this, um, uh, of these, these human sciences is, uh, and this is impossible, I think, to, this is impossible to, um, to test, but it's, um, uh, but it's very interesting to reflect on. He says these sciences are all caught, they all have a single movement, they're caught in a single kind of pattern, and whatever they do, they, they move back and forth in this pattern and they can't get out of it. Um, uh, each of them is governed by three uh, options, three strategies. Uh, and uh, each of these human sciences then, uh, study of culture, study of psychology, and the study of sociology, uh, will generate a certain number of schools and positions which correspond to these structural possibilities, which are the only ones they have. Uh, and it's a structural oscillation so that uh, a certain number of positions, kind of illusion of variety can come into being. That is, it can look as though uh, contemporary psychology is a very lively field in which all kinds of different things are happening and so on. But that's only because uh, of this uh, structural, these structural possibilities within the model. Here are the page 357. Here's a, a brief... Um, uh, uh, list of these of these three possibilities. These three pairs, three pairs of, uh, on the one hand, function and norm, then conflict and rule, and finally signification and system. These three pairs completely cover the entire domain of what can be known about man. That is, these these give us the complete table of all of the structural possibilities of the so-called um, of the so-called human sciences. Uh, and this is worked out in much more detail uh, later on, I think, in this, um, this chapter. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, and, uh, and as I say, although, uh, although uh, it's, it's impossible to, um, it's impossible to test a, a kind of global hypothesis of this kind, um, uh, it would be very interesting to, to, to and, and, and also, although Foucault himself fails to, um, fails to work it out in detail for us, that is, um, uh, the other, if you had an idea like that, the other way to realize it would be simply to make a, to make a kind of uh, overall history of the human sciences or ta tableau of the human sciences today and show how each of the various theoretical positions corresponded to positions in this, uh, in this table. That, of course, he doesn't do. Uh, but nonetheless, his, these, um, this description is very, uh, uh, is, I think, a very, um, a very interesting one. I'm trying to find that, the, other, uh, the other section in which this is worked out. Uh, you see, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a double, uh, it's a double kind of movement. On the one hand, each of these sciences can pick uh, a, one of the three models. Uh, that is the model of, of, the, uh, of the norm, of law, the model of rule and conflict, which is a dramatic model, or uh, the model of system, which is uh, basically a hermeneutic model. Uh, and within each of these models, having picked that, uh, it can also slide from a description of, um, of, of, of these things as events uh, to a description of them as, uh, as system. So that each one of the three, so that I guess there are about, there's sort of six, six basic possibilities in this, um, uh, in, in this um, uh, kind of table of, of, of possible models of, of the human sciences. Now, the one which we'll see dealt with in the book on prisons is obviously that of, uh, of the norm, but it would be interesting there too to ask ourselves whether, uh, whether, that, uh, whether that could be rewritten uh, in terms of these other, uh, of these other, uh, these other things. Now, uh, the problem with calling this kind of uh, analysis, and this is really um, certainly in some classical sense of the form, structural analysis in that uh, it gives us uh, an image of closure. It says uh, you can only think, uh, the only positions available to the mind are these, and these correspond to a uh, kind of ironclad system that uh, 
uh, uh, an ironclad uh, combinatory uh, system, or, or calculus if you like, uh, which has no possibilities but those, and which then uh, also has a kind of, um, operates in the sense of the negative hermeneutic in that it demystifies our experience of these sciences. It says, look at uh, uh, this particular position, for example, imagines that it is, um, uh, that it is making uh, scientific statements of an absolute kind. In fact, it's only working out, it's only part of the play of, of, of these various positions and it's only part of a, a kind of combinational scheme of which the following uh, uh, alternatives are other, are other examples. So I think that's, a, that's in itself a, a very kind of powerful um, method of, um, of, uh, of demystification. But it's a, it's a method which is kind of purely formal. That is, uh, beyond this, there's nothing except the position of the historian himself who presumably, well, we don't know what position he fits in or whether he, uh, is, is this book part of the human sciences? Uh, is a history uh, in Foucault's sense to be uh, included in, in, in these uh, ideological areas or does it have some completely different status? Well, clearly, in some way, it has to have a different status if, it, if from its point of view, uh, we are able to see this, uh, see these, um, see these structures, but it's not clear how it could have this status and what uh, um, and what um, uh, what it could appeal to. Well, in fact, what it appeals to is the future, uh, and this is the, the the final passage that I read you the other day. Uh, it says, uh, if it's so that we can now become aware of this system of the human sciences as being a kind of closure that we're caught in. Uh, that is, we're, we're, uh, we are in some way um, uh, chained to these, to these alternatives, but now we're at least aware of them as such, which is already uh, the beginnings of some other way of thinking about it. Yet, we're not, we're not out of this system yet. Uh, we, haven't, uh, we are, in some sense, still uh, shackled to these, to these, uh, to these alternatives. Uh, well, then, what we have to say is that... Um, uh, our awareness of our own imprisonment in this structural closure is anticipatory or enunciatory. That is, uh, we have to think that some new kind of thought is coming into being, of which this awareness is a kind of harbinger, uh, and in the light of which some new episteme, in the light of which we'll be able to look back on all this and it, as a closed episode in, uh, in, in human history. And that's a very familiar kind of... Uh, uh, kind of appeal to, and I think not, not at all um, illicit, except that again, it's, uh, it's presupposition, it's, it's, uh, it's basic presuppositions, I think, are still, uh, the trouble with them is not the enunciatory part or the anticipatory uh, things involved, which one could find in, in the work of Bloch, uh, for example, among other people, but rather, again, this idea of the episteme as something that you're closed into, that you're, uh, that you're, uh, uh, that you're uh, absolutely condemned to and uh, which you can't get out of uh, except by a kind of radical but meaningless mutation uh, in which suddenly a new episteme takes the place of the old one and then you're imprisoned inside of that, presumably. So uh, it's, that, um, uh, it's that notion which, is, uh, which I think is, is uh, is problematic on, and not, not really the, the appeal to the, to the future as, as such. Uh, now, the other thing I want to point out about, uh, about this uh, book before leaving it in the form in which we're dealing with it right now is, is that um, even though we've just said that uh, one can see here a kind of ideological analysis, uh, which is very powerful but also very somehow very exasperating in that uh, if it's so that we are, that this closure is something uh, in which we're caught, then uh, it really doesn't seem to do us any good to know about it. I mean, uh, there's this, there doesn't seem to be any way in which uh, by thinking about these things we can do anything about them, and that's uh, already, I think, a, uh, not perhaps uh, the, 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 um, necessarily the best result for a for an operation of uh, demystification to have, 
but uh, if it's so that nonetheless that we can look at this as a kind of demystification of, among other things, of these things that call themselves human sciences, uh, in another sense, uh, it's not. And Foucault is very careful to say that ideological analysis and hermeneutics as such are part of the vicious circle of the human sciences themselves. Because one of, their, uh, one of the other rhythms that they have, since they, are, they do sort of exist in the void, they turn on themselves, their kind of constant interrogation of themselves as, uh, as sheer uh, representation, one of their characteristic, one of their own characteristic movements is demystification. That is a science of, or a, 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 a system built on, um, built on um, representations has one permanent vocation which is constantly to demystify itself. Because it's aware, for example, sociologists, for example, uh, here's, this, is, this is the dialectic of these human sciences. Dialectic now in a kind of bad sense, not a good sense, but has a good sense. Uh, the dialectic of the human sciences is that uh, in sociology, you deal with the representations people have of their own society. But of course, you deal with them in the form of representations. You are yourself a part of that society, and therefore, you must begin to ask yourselves questions about uh, sociology as, uh, as a representation of society, what is the, uh, what is the foundation of uh, sociological knowledge, uh, and you have the things that, uh, you have the, the sociology of sociology, the, the sociology of knowledge of the kind that Mannheim and, and, uh, and uh, um, Scheler and, and, and people like that uh, were, were involved in, and you get a kind of proto-ideological analysis in which sociology demystifies itself as part of its own procedures. Well, for, for Foucault, uh, that's, and that's not a vicious circle, of course, except that, um, except that it is an indefinite kind of um, uh, process, because uh, no matter uh, what certainty you arrive at as to the scientific basis of your presuppositions, the next sociologist of knowledge will then deal with your uh, book on the subject and show that it's the ideology of something or other of some kind of science of sociology and thus demystify it and so on. So it really is a uh, an interminable uh, process in Freud's term uh, and uh, e even uh, if it does sometimes square the circle. Well for Foucault this exists in all of these human sciences because uh, they have no uh, they have no ontological foundation. Uh, here is a, a page 326. Um, this is the, the this concerns the relationship of man, and again, this word is used uh, uh, in, in, uh, for the the subject, but I guess in a sense the masculine subject. So in, in a way, it's it's, it's not uh, illicit to use it that way. Uh, concerns the relation of man to the unthought, which is Foucault's whole word for uh, the area of um, uh, not only of the Freudian unconscious, but for that area which will be uh, the very terrain of any ideological analysis or any demystification because you always have to say, well look, this text says this, but behind it is something which it doesn't say which is the real truth. And so the impensé or the unthought, the non-thought uh, is, is the, the more generic term for this whole, um, for this whole area of the unconscious which, with which ideological analysis will be concerned. Uh, okay, this is a, this uh, second point he's about to make concerns the relationship of man to the unthought, or more precisely their twin appearance in Western culture. That is, the appearance of man or the bourgeois subject as the, um, as the uh, very place of these human sciences, and at once along with that, the appearance of uh, a, an opposite or an underside of the subject, which is the unconscious, the unthought, and so forth. It seems obvious enough that from the, from the moment when man first constituted himself as a positive figure in the field of knowledge, the old privilege of reflexive knowledge, of thought thinking itself, could not but disappear. But that it became possible by this very fact that as you can't, uh, you can't, uh, the, the cogito is no longer uh, a, uh, a um, it, it will no longer be respected as the foundation of philosophical knowledge. Uh, one doubts even that, even the certainty of the cogito. Um, uh, but that it became possible by this very fact for an objective form of thought to investigate man in his, in his entirety, 
at the risk of discovering what could never be reached by his reflection, conscious reflection, or even by his consciousness. Dim mechanisms, faceless determinations, a whole landscape of shadow that has been termed directly or indirectly the unconscious. For, it is not the un for is not the unconscious what necessarily yields itself up to the scientific thought man applies to himself when he ceases to conceive of himself in the form of reflection? As a matter of fact, the unconscious and the forms of the unthought in general have not been the reward granted to a positive knowledge of man. Man and the unthought are, at the archaeological level, this level of the episteme, uh, are contemporaries. Man has not been able to describe himself as a configuration in the episteme without thought at the, at the same time discovering both in itself and outside itself, at its borders, yet also in its very warp and woof, an element of darkness, an apparently inner density in which it is embedded, an unthought which it consists entirely, which it contains entirely, yet in which it is also caught. So in that sense, uh, when at the end of this uh, book, man disappears, the unconscious will disappear too. Uh, and or, or if you want to look back at the other end of history, Baudrillard would say, will say, I don't know if I mentioned this before, that uh, the, the point about tribal life is tribal man knows no unconscious. Uh, the unconscious is a product of civilization, repression, uh, and all the rest of it. So one ought to be able then to imagine forms of existence uh, which, are, which don't involve the subject, the self in our, in our sense, man in, in this sense, the human sciences, uh, but, and by the same token, don't involve, um, don't involve an unconscious at all. Uh, well, if that's the case, of course, then, then the whole enterprise of ideological analysis is doomed because it's only part of this vicious circle of these human sciences uh, turning in their treadmill and reinventing their own presuppositions in a kind of, uh, in a kind of way. And what happens uh, is that uh, they, don't reach any, uh, they don't reach any ultimate ground of, of, uh, of, uh, of certainty, but they merely disappear. Now, all this seems hard enough to uh, reconcile with the, the idea that beyond these things there are linguistics, uh, psychoanalysis, and, um, uh, and ethnology, and it's not clear really from this book how he sees, um, uh, how, how he sees those becoming some new mode of knowledge which, uh, which, we're, not, um, uh, which we're not aware of. But nonetheless, it seems to me that uh, this, is, um, uh, this is essentially the, the thrust of this um, uh, of the second part uh, of this book, and it and it is the ambivalence that it that it that it has for us uh, in um, uh, in as a, as an example uh, of ideological analysis, which nonetheless somehow uh, challenges the very possibility of it. Now, this said, I want to leave uh, this work, uh, as I say, uh, in its for itself. Uh, are there any are there any questions about it that have been raised over the last weeks before we? Go on and background it as uh, uh, as a as uh, see it then as a more as a preparation for this other book than uh, than in so. Okay, uh, I think we want to say um, two things uh, about it. First of all, um, as a way of pushing it into a kind of more general background of Foucault's works. Uh, first of all, uh, this is uh, uh, this remains obviously a historical narrative, uh, and it's a narrative which uh, says once upon a time, uh, the once upon a time being uh, the, the Renaissance term. But as people pointed out in general, that could be that could be medieval thought, or it could be uh, even tribal thought, uh, which has then two uh, principal um, uh, two principal um, Moments, uh, the classical, and I don't know what to call the 19th century part, we'll call the humanistic or the, the historicist moment. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the future, uh, the, um, the anticipation of, of some quite different mutation, which would be, what, a structural moment? I don't, at this point, he's willing to call it that later on. Um, a a post-individualistic moment. Now, uh, a lot of things have been pointed out about these four these four uh, periods. They're obviously quite, um, they're not on the same level with each other uh, in, as descriptions, um, because one is merely enunciatory, 
the Renaissance thing is really only a starting point. That is, it is only that which is negated uh, by uh, when we, uh, that, that which is there in order to be negated by the later terms so that we can show that something has changed. Um, in fact, I think uh, it would be here useful to, um, to use this distinction that Said makes in his book Beginnings between a beginning and an origin, that is, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Renaissance term uh, moment is something like an origin, uh, where uh, our story only begins with the classical epistemy. Uh, so we really have two, two very different um, kinds of historical starting points here. We have a kind of Ur term, uh, which is somehow that of, um, uh, that of very distant primitive thought. Uh, and then we have... Uh, the, the, um, the, the, the term which precedes our own term and uh, uh, which allows us, therefore, to tell our own term as a story. See, um, now I want to show and I want to deal with um, these books uh, and indeed a number of the things we're going to be reading in, in, in these terms. I want to show that uh, these are really, no matter how static uh, this analysis may seem. What is being told, uh, the analysis really depends absolutely on the existence of a narrative or a story. That is, it seems to me there isn't any way that, um, that we could understand this critique of contemporary thought uh, unless it had been presented to us as, as a transformation of something. That is, uh, I think it would be that the very terms of this description are, um, uh, are inconceivable except as part of a story, a narrative which is being told. That is to say, there was a classical episteme which then began to pull apart. On its ruins, something came into being which is modern thinking. That's already a story with at least two positions, but as we've seen, really three because there's the, the earlier terms. Uh, are we, we're being told about this then, if, if you like, it's a synchronic system to introduce these, these, uh, these structural terms. Uh, um, the, the system is synchronic that Foucault is describing. We are caught in the episteme. Each of these epistemes is synchronic. That is, it forms a system in itself. We don't have to, uh, is everyone familiar with these linguistic terms? Uh, we, we don't have to have, um, uh, uh, any, any kind of historical explanation in order to understand how the system functions. Uh, and yet, oddly enough, and that, maybe that's so, you know, although I think we have some questions about whether, uh, about the whole notion of an episteme and whether, whether there is a system like that that is a kind of total system that functions in a kind of closure. Um, it's certainly described to us as functioning in a closure uh, and, and in a systematic way. Uh, indeed, the condemnation of the human sciences is made on that basis. You're stuck in the human sciences. You can't think any other way. But the reason for that is because uh, you, because of the distance you entertain to these other parts of the episteme. So this is this is the presentation of a synchronic mechanism, kind of total mechanism. Yet the presentation is done diachronically. That is uh, the way Foucault, the only way Foucault uh, is able to put this into paper to, to, to formally present the synchronic system is by showing how it emerged. Now, my point is not that he explains how it emerged. Uh, clearly, uh, he doesn't want to. And I think, have, have I already mentioned some of those sections where uh, you, you, you're tempted to say, well, here, suddenly uh, we have this uh, cataclysmic transformation. This old episteme falls to pieces. Something new takes its place. What is this transformation? What is this mutation? Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in terms of European history, I think uh, since it does, after all, sort of co coincide with uh, the, the pa passage from the 18th to the 19th century with the French Revolution, uh, emergence of industrial capitalism, all kinds of things like that, romanticism, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of tempting at once to assimilate this change to something that we know already and give it a, give it a name. Foucault uh, is very reluctant to do this, and uh, he says, if I can find this uh, one section, which I think is very, very um, revealing. Um, 
uh, page 50 to 51. He says, um, well, let's not, let's not generalize too fast. We don't know enough. These are just local probes. Uh, this is a kind of local archaeology of various areas. We, we just can't, we just can't uh, explain this as a total phenomenon. Discontinuity. The fact that within the space of a few years, a culture sometimes ceases to think as it had been thinking up till then and begins to think other things in a new way, discontinuity probably begins with an erosion from outside, from that space which is, for thought, on the other side, but which it has never ceased to think from the very beginning to try to think. Ultimately, the problem that presents itself is that of the relations between thought and culture. How is it that thought has a place in the space of the world, that it has its origin there, and that it never ceases in this place or that to begin anew? But perhaps it is not yet time to pose this problem. That is, I, I don't think I will ex explain this change. Um, perhaps we should wait until the archaeology of thought has been established more firmly and it, and it is better able to gauge what it is capable of describing directly and positively until it has defined the particular systems and internal connections it has to deal with before attempting to encompass thought and to investigate how it contrives to escape itself. For the moment, then, let it suffice that we accept these discontinuities in the simultaneously manifest and obscure empirical order wherever they posit themselves. Now, in, a, in another book of mine in which I mentioned Foucault, I, I was sort of unfair uh, uh, to him in, in, uh, in, uh, in picking on a passage like this and, and because I suggested that, um, and I think that part of it is still true, that in the terms, in it, for a thought which is thinking of history and periodization in terms of epistemies that are closed like this, it's clear that the break will always fall outside of these systems. So you have no, no uh, code or terms in which to deal with a break. If you're, if, you're, if you're talking the language of synchronic systems, the passage from one to the other has to be incomprehensible, right? because that falls outside of what you're able to, to, to deal with. Now, where I, and I think, as I say, I still think this is so, uh, all the more so in this sense that for him, historical explanation is part of one of these systems the 19th century epistemy. So obviously, the one area of thinking that you might be tempted to appeal to to explain how we get from one of these, one of these things to another, history, is invalidated because it's already locked up in one of the, one of the epistemies themselves. So there is no, there, Foucault has no, uh, no means of explaining uh, the break, and I think he would deny that one could do such a thing and that, that, uh, that being asked that question makes any sense. Because for him, uh, uh, any, any um, uh, kind of thinking which uh, tries to give a picture of co continuous change, right? If we, if we show how the 18th century turned into the 19th century, we're telling a, histo a, a kind of continuous narrative, then we're back in the old history of ideas, in, in idealism, uh, uh, in Hegelianism, uh, uh, as at least what the Althusserians think of as Hegelianism, and so on. Uh, we're back in 19th century thought, essentially. So that's, so that's impossible. So all we can do is make a theory of discontinuity, of the radical break. Uh, and as you know, uh, this theory ultimately comes through Althusser from Gaston Bachelard and his th history of the sciences, uh, in which he uh, analyzes science. He says um, uh, the, uh, it's very wrong to say that, um, that the that the hard sciences have a history in, 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 in this old-fashioned sense. Uh, you don't look around and say, well, Democritus believed in atoms, and so there were, Democritus thus anticipated modern uh, atomic physics. You search the past for so many anticipations, because uh, none of these, these concepts are all radically different from each other. Uh, and not only are they different, they don't make any ultimate unity. Uh, they are all science works locally, uh, with individual problems, breaking with previous solutions and, and making new ones and indeed making new problems. This is Bachelard's coupure epistemologique, uh, epistemological break. Uh, and thus, science is itself a matter of radical discontinuities. Althusser <coughs> takes this over for uh, his description of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, 
well, Marx, Marx's relationship to his forebears, and Foucault generalizes it then in his, uh, in his theory of, archaeo of the archaeology of the past, not as a description of continuous things, the old-fashioned history of ideas, but rather as, uh, as an account of radical breaks, radical discontinuity. So for, so for Foucault, for, for Foucault um, this objection I've just made is not, um, uh, is not valid because it's made from, a, from an episteme which is itself closed or ideological. Uh, uh, from another sense, I, I think it still makes some sense. Uh, uh, the, 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 um, what I would maybe not say quite so strongly now uh, is that uh, Foucault is, um, uh, that Foucault rules out other kinds of, of explanations because uh, there is this um, enigmatic but nonetheless uh, um, important qualification here. Um, discontinuity probably begins with an erosion from outside. That is, uh, these epistemes w are changed by things which are not thought. That is, they are the readaptation of mental systems to something which is outside of mental systems. Uh, now, he doesn't say what that is, where that is, uh, in other words, what form this infrastructure might take, which is having some effect on superstructures, which are sort of changing above it. Uh, but in the book on prisons, he will be much more, um, uh, much more willing to, um, uh, to uh, make some place for the kind of garden variety facts of, of, of history, demographic explosion in the, in the late 18th century, for example, uh, the relationship between prisons and modes of production, things like that. Although the place he makes for these things, and also in the archaeology of knowledge, the place he makes for these things, that is these m more uh, uh, infrastructural levels of, of history, which may have some relationship to, uh, to these otherwise incomprehensible mutations of, of, of epistemological systems uh, is always, uh, is never a systematic one, uh, is always a kind of by the way or, or a kind of uh, um, uh, a, uh, a kind of admission en passant that, uh, that these things play a role, but is never systematically uh, integrated into its description because of course at that point uh, the whole framework of, of the description of the episteme would, um, would, would break up. Uh, nonetheless, uh, although Foucault does not have a, a theory of historical change, nonetheless, uh, it remains the case, it seems to me, that this is a historical narrative. Because the very mode of presentation uh, is one in which uh, you say, once there was this, and then it turned into that. Uh, and, in which, uh, and in which, indeed, you can't describe that, term two, except by appeal to term one. Uh, and so I think uh, we, we here uh, find at work something which I think is, um, uh, is uh, basic in, um, as a, at least as an as a, as a area of, of uh, investigation, the, the dependency of, uh, even of synchronic descriptions of this kind on narratives which are in one way or another repressed which are present but repressed. Now, uh, there, there's an important essay on Foucault by Hayden White. Uh, it's in a not terribly recent issue of theory, uh, history and theory. Does anybody know? 1973, called uh, Foucault Decoded, in which White um, has a, um, uh, a rather different explanation of the, uh, the consistency of these four moments of Foucault. He says, uh, and I think this is probably true too, and if you know White's work, you would know what he was about to say, of course, in an article like this. He says, well, these four epistemes, <coughs> these are the tropes. Each of these things corresponds to the four great tropes, which are, the, as you know, uh, probably the, the, the kind of uh, ordering framework of, of White's own book, Meta History, and, and his way of analyzing a historical narrative. Uh, now, I've, I think that White's tropes are also a story, because there's a kind of cycle in his, uh, in his system which goes from a kind of naive uh, metaphorical imagination to a kind of disabused, reflexive, ironic, uh, 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 self-questioning one in the final term. And, uh, 
So I think, in a way, as interesting as that, as that, um, uh, as that demystification of Foucault's history may be, that is to say, you know, this is not really history, it's really, uh, it's poetry, it's like Vico, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the operation of, of, of tropes. Uh, nonetheless, uh, even White's demystification needs uh, a, a more basic one, which is that that also is a narrative. And that, so we, we again come back to the idea that um, uh, what we have here is, uh, is, a, um, uh, is, a, is a narrative framework of some kind, and a narrative framework which clearly uh, does not want to uh, name itself as such, because um, uh, for one thing, uh, the status of narrative is not clear here. If you associate narrative then with, uh, with continuity, uh, with continuous stories of change, then we're back in one of the ideological moments denounced by Foucault, and narrative has no, um, no basic uh, foundation. Now, um, again, these are fairly easy for us, these moments, to assimilate to, um, to, to uh, sta more standard conceptions of, of Western of Western history, uh, the I think the first Renaissance moment would then become medieval culture. Uh, what he's calling here the classical epistemy would correspond to the Ancien Régime, whatever whatever Baroque absolutism, however one wants to qualify that. Then uh, to uh, to um, bourgeois uh, society of the 19th and 20th centuries. And finally, um, something else, and I think uh, maybe when we come to Foucault's book on sexuality, we'll see that there's something else in, in another sense is sort of the consumer society side of, of uh, or moment, late moment of, of bourgeois society. So these things fall into some kind of place as, um, as immediately, uh, as uses of his, historiographical stereotypes. I would like to propose uh, deeper versions of these things because this is a, this, this, we're going to run into these schemes again and again. I think I spoke a little bit about modes of production the other day, and I don't want to go into that in much detail today. But I, I want to, um, uh, I want to give that at least some initial uh, content by saying that, um, suggesting that all of our thinking about different cultural and historical difference is grounded uh, not only on, uh, ultimately, on differences in modes of production and the way they succeed each other, but essentially on a scheme something like this. That is, uh, we see our own, and our own society has always described itself as being economic society. Uh, it is preceded then by a society uh, of, which is not uh, organized by the market, uh, by the operation of, therefore, of kind of self-policing uh, rules and, and the play of various equalities and so forth, but rather by a domination and by political power. Uh, and therefore, uh, there being these two moments, economic society and political society, uh, political society, the, the, the feudal society, society of the domination of... Um, uh, of, of a domination which is a form of personal relationship rather than economic relationship, which is therefore a form of direct relationship and not the indirect relationship that we have with each other and with authority and so on in the market system. Uh, it's, it's clear that then these societies also have a kind of negation, which is a society which is neither a power society nor an economic society, and that is uh, that would be then uh, not uh, feudal or pre-capitalist society, but tribal or primitive society. Now, it seems to me that in one way or another, all of our longest focus thinking about history falls into these uh, uh, in, in, falls into these uh, categories, uh, which you can complete with whatever you imagine to come, whatever other possibilities you imagine coming after this, and they could be cyclical, they can be the return. Uh, science fiction is interesting this way for showing the various uh, possible variants of, of, of uh, changes that we ring in our kind of imagination, again in this area of pop history, on these historical paradigms. If you think of the future as being the return of dominance, then you have images of sort of a new barbarism that overcomes the earth and so on and, and so on and so forth. And there are kind of, I think, a structurally limited number of uh, possible ways of imagining the future, all of which 
uh, are uh, so many changes rung on these basic, uh, on these basic uh, uh, categories. Um, now, I mention this because in Adorno and Horkheimer also, we'll have a, a kind of not very clearly thought out perspective of, um, uh, of uh, tribal uh, existence and then the coming into being of societies of power and then of economic society of bourgeois society too. It's under the surface, but it's not, uh, it's not, um, it's not thus uh, clearly articulated, but it's, uh, but it's always present. Now, uh, in that sense, uh, it, makes, uh, it's in, it becomes interesting to, um, to interrogate Foucault uh, as, a, um, uh, as a contribution to our uh, understanding of the passage from a power society to an economic society. Clearly, uh, all of his books deal with this central, uh, with this central moment of, of emergence, which is the emergence of capitalism, middle class society, whatever you want to call it. And indeed, they are all, in that sense, polemic. And this is yet another polemic going on that I think we've, uh, we haven't uh, spoken about quite so directly. Uh, in that sense, they challenge the, the presuppositions of this society uh, about itself. One of the, one of the um, were thought of not either in humanistic terms, uh, in Shakespearean terms as having some special kind of madness, uh, or, and indeed we're, we're free, and we're not, uh, we're not in prison at all. So for him, um, the, uh, the self-congratulatory descriptions of the coming into being of the modern, um, of, of, of the modern uh, study, of modern psychiatry, of the analysis of the insane and of their treatment in clinics and so on, uh, in one sense, uh, one of the purposes of his book is to show that this is by no means uh, such a subject of uh, self-congratulation as, as we might think. Uh, that is, we are not opposing a new middle class um, uh, um, uh, humanism, essentially, a new humane mode of dealing with the world and with other people to some more barbaric kind of feudal uh, mode of, of, uh, of, of oppressing them or dominating them or whatever, but rather that this is precisely a new form of domination, that it is a new way of producing the other that our culture needs to feel itself, that is, uh, in order to feel ourselves as norm, we have to feel that there exists such a thing as deviancy. On the, on the level of so-called mental health, whatever that is, that's the norm, uh, we have to have something which is therefore uh, insanity, and thus, in that sense, we produce insanity in order to uh, to, to 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 justify the um, uh, the organization of our of our society in in a very uh, existential and, and lived sense. That is, this is not only something going on in the realm of thought, but uh, it's something which is part of our uh, of of the way daily life gets sorted out for us. Uh, if uh, um, we have to believe that there's such a thing as uh, rationality. Uh, that is to say that there's a that there's a a, um, a single real world in which which rational people can inhabit uh, in order uh, in in a way to to uh, to, to to govern our our, our lives properly uh, and in order to feel this um, uh, to feel the existence of this single real world in which we rationally exist uh, and which we're told. Uh, which we're told to live in rationally. You know, if, if uh, we happen to be upset, then we're told to, um, to uh, uh, um, uh, have what, you know, the, the whole vocabulary of neo-Freudianism to, 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 to adapt, to understand that we've been projecting and so on, to withdraw our kind of momentary aberration from reality, to come to terms with reality again, and so on and so forth. But we have to be able to feel that, that, uh, that there is some kind of ba basic um, uh, underlying uh, regularity and, and, and meaning in daily life. And in order to do that, therefore, we have to believe that there are people who are not like that. There are people who are insane, uh, who are for whom, uh, the, for whom the world really doesn't exist in, in, in the, and the reality of the world doesn't exist in that sense at all. Uh, and therefore, they play a very important part in the economy of our, uh, of our world. Well, Foucault's, therefore, this, this first major book, The History of Madness, had as one of its ideological thrusts uh, the attack on this liberal history of liberalism. Right? This is liberalism's own history of itself. 
And one of, its, uh, one of the uh, awards it's given itself is that it has gotten rid of all the, 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 the barbarity of uh, older uh, tyrannical uh, um, types of, uh, of, uh, of, of domination and replaced them by a humane kind of reasoned uh, treatment of the insane, among other things. Well, now, uh, it seems very clear that uh, the, um, and you'll, uh, as you'll see in a moment, the prisons book then very clearly is going to fit into that same into that same mold, since, as we'll see in a second, one of the basic uh, cliches of the history of prisons is that at the same time that Charenton was being pioneered, that a new and more humane view of the insane was coming into being, also uh, uh, there were new uh, and liberal and humane theories of prison reform, uh, uh, which uh, came into being in the late 18th and early 19th century, and which reorganized the way in which we dealt with, um, uh, with uh, criminality. So that, uh, so, that, so that this will also be an attack on that reading of history as being the, the movement from um, repressive, uh, repressive arbitrariness to uh, humane uh, rationality. It's this kind of simple uh, history of the bourgeoisie by itself that, uh, that Foucault is... Um, uh, is going to draw into question. But in doing so, uh, you notice that the key moment is always this moment of the emergence of the modern world, uh, whatever one wants to call this. But there's a famous book by uh, Karl Polanyi called The Great Transformation, which is, I guess, as good a word as, as any for this process, which whereby something which had never before existed in the world, a type of daily life, a type of organization, uh, indeed, maybe even, as we were saying a moment ago, a new type of psychological subject came into being. Uh, and therefore, all of these books are contributions to this, uh, to, a, um, to a description of this great transformation. And that's, it's in that sense that we'll, we'll, we're going to interrogate them as histories. Um, but uh, but uh, in that light, I think, then, um, we have a question, we have several questions to ask about the order of things, namely, uh, how it also sees, that is, what is the value in the order of things of the classical episteme? That's never clear. Uh, clearly, the, the classical episteme is not, exactly, um, is not exactly that whole realm of the arbitrary of domination and oppression, which is put to flight by the emergence of the human sciences in the 19th century. Uh, it's, it's clear, however, that the human sciences are themselves very vigorously and, and thoroughly discredited. Uh, and so uh, this kind of additional claim that besides um, humane prison laws, humane uh, um, uh, clinical uh, 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 institutions and so forth, uh, a whole new uh, science of the humane or the human came into being, uh, that this is part of the whole, uh, of the whole procedure. It turns out in Survey Punir that, uh, that it really is not uh, certain any longer whether uh, this classical episteme is to be understood as uh, being part of the new middle class order as it's coming into being or being part of the ancien regime uh, with which uh, it's a, there's a break. Uh, the, the key image, I don't know if I've mentioned it before, here it turns out to be something uh, the making of grid works, the organization of everything into grid works, and I think there uh, that's there are probably references to uh, to surveying and to various kinds of geometry and and, and so forth. But uh, this term, which is which uh, is used from time to time in the earlier books, becomes then the leitmotif for uh, for the prison book, and therefore. Uh, is to be seen as the fundamental image, really, of modern life. This modern life uh, is, e even though that's not what it's directly about, uh, it is implied that uh, the experience of modern life is the increasing imposition of grids, the organization of everything, all realms of experience into grids. That is to say, the disappearance of some older kind of space, now, now I'm reasoning back from, from Foucault's implications, the disappearance of some older kind of space which would not be homogeneous space like this. This is the coming into being of homogeneous space. 
In philosophy, this is called extension in Cartesian uh, terms. That is, that which is susceptible to, uh, to geometrical uh, uh, um, uh, to, to ge geometrical expression or to mathematical uh, for formalization. Uh, before this comes into being, uh, space, therefore, must be understood as being uh, non-homogeneous, heterogeneous, uh, as, uh, as being a, a, an affair in which uh, the same laws don't apply everywhere, in which there are pockets of things which are very different from other things, a world, therefore, in which, and now I'm going sort of fast, uh, in which, which is a world, let's say, of the sacred. That is where, for example, in, in the experience of sacred space, uh, certain places are very different from others. The place which is sacred uh, it has a radically different charge of power and, uh, and organizes things around it in a very different way than non-sacred, profane uh, space and so forth. So behind this uh, emergence of homogeneous space, totally organized space, uh, is some, at least some first term, right, uh, which we could describe uh, in this sense. Now, when you come to Adorno and Horkheimer, uh, you'll see that they, they, the language of the sacred is one that they use a great deal, and so they will call this, this new, newly emergent world this, this corresponds to everything in, uh, everything in the world. Everything is organized like this. Time is organized like this. Uh, all experiences fall into some such pattern. They'll call this emergence desacralization, that is, uh, the loss of the sacred, or the transformation of the sacred into what is administrable. Uh, and then, so behind the Frankfurt School, there's yet another... Uh, there's yet another uh, uh, term, and ultimately I want to compare this, this system of describing the, the, the process we're talking about with that of Foucault, the terminology of Max Weber, the whole terminology of rationalization. That is, this world of the grid works is the rationalized world, the world which has been uh, broken down into its smallest Cartesian unities and which is now administrable and therefore it will immediately be a world of bureaucracies because that's what bureaucracies do and that's the kind of world uh, they inhabit. Now this is Weber's thought. Um, so we have two traditions. I don't know that Foucault ever, s he may mention Weber, but I don't know that he ever says anything about Weber that's a, that, a, that's a, that really amounts to a taking a position. It seems to me that we have a kind of reinvention by Foucault in a language which is his, um, uh, he calls this new work um, the study of the, um, the, the, the technologie politique du corps, the political technology of the body. This is the new word. I think I couldn't think of it the other day. Uh, his, the older method was the archaeology of knowledge. The new method of these books will now be called the study of the political technology of the body. And then I think one can look back at the older books and see those in a new way as being contributions to this method. Well, this method and mode of analysis that Foucault is now working on uh, would seem to be, have a lot of parallelisms uh, in its object and in its mode of proceedings to Weber's uh, much more um, now classical um, uh, uh, method and tradition of analyzing um, rationality, and that's a rationalization, I beg your pardon, rationality in the economic sense, Taylorism and so on. Uh, and uh, that's a tradition which, as you know, is not only that of mainstream sociology, but then also of a certain Marxism, since Lukács' notion of reification comes immediately from it. And then, as you'll see in the next time, the Frankfurt School's uh, whole picture of uh, desacralization comes at least in part from, from Weber too. So these are two descriptions, these will be two descriptions, two possible um, versions of what happened in the Great Transformation, of how you, these will be not only two uh, codes in which we can talk about what happened when the modern world emerged, when modernization happened, uh, which is another kind of uh, anthropological, sociological uh, euphemism for this process. Um, and they will also, I think, tell us something about the problem of telling a story like that. Because again, uh, as I've 
said several times already, it, it is a narrative. We're saying uh, it was like this before, uh, and then uh, it turned into this. But what is it? And how does one tell a story like that? How does one tell uh, a history like that? However, it being always understood that ultimately um, this is really the only story that anybody ever tells, and this is the ultimate narrative framework of any other type of uh, research that one can imagine in, in, in these areas. That is, uh, in, in, uh, uh, as we saw with this synchronic description, Foucault couldn't make a synchronic description of uh, 19th century thought. He had to recast it in one way or another into this narrative form where he said, once people thought like this, and then that thought system broke up, and so forth. Now, as we saw, that was a buried narrative. Uh, it was a kind of, um, it was a little bit, it was an abstract narrative. It makes you think a little bit of, um, if you've seen some of the, oh, is it Fernand Léger, Ballet Mécanique, and, and, and also some of the cartoons, the earliest cartoons. You have something which is narrative, but which doesn't use pe people, doesn't use characters or, or representational things. It's a kind of uh, abstract narrative. Things change and happen, you follow them change, and no doubt you could reconstruct a kind of buried narrative underneath those changes, but uh, the characters are dots and lines or something, or, or they're, uh, they're geometrical forms. They're not, uh, they're not anthropomorphic characters anymore. Well, it's as though on that level, uh, Les Moines les Choses, the order of things, told a kind of abstract narrative that it's, it didn't say once upon a time uh, people uh, lived like this and then they then they began to live in another way. Rather, it said, once upon a time, there were these three levels, uh, which were transparent to each other. Then, little by little, these levels began to split apart from each other, began to become autonomous. In between, in the space between them, this, this or that came into being. So we have something which is really a story, but which is done in terms of, um, uh, I don't want to call it metaphor, because it's not a metaphor that is, there's a question about what it's a metaphor for, so that's not a good word. Uh, in terms of a pure, a pure abstraction, it seems to be, pure abstract form. Uh, so what we have, but we know that underneath this abstract narrative is a much more concrete one to which we can put the vocabulary of our choice and we can say, uh, oh yes, that narrative is how the Ancien Regime gave way to capitalism or something. You know. Or we can use some other language for it. That would be a much, again, a more recognizable historical narrative. But so we know that underneath this abstract narrative, uh, something else is repressed, which is history in a more recognizable sense. Yet this narrative continues to function. Uh, okay, now something like this, I think, is the way to talk about uh, the book on prisons. You know, if you've seen this book, you know, uh, you know that. Uh, or it's generally known that Foucault uh, is very much a, uh, a uh, radical politically in, in certain ways, that one of the areas that he's been most concerned with, that he is concerned with a kind of local politics on a local level. I think I read that he was just, uh, he's involved now in a, um, in, uh, a group that's concerned with um, the um, medical treatment in, um, in, within the, the, the quarters or the, of Paris, and uh, which therefore uh, is interested in the operation of, of, uh, of clinics in these areas and how they deal with, uh, with, with people and, and so forth. And this is clearly, again, a, a kind of practical politics which, uh, of, of, a, of a local type, which is very comparable to his, uh, to his uh, historical practice. Uh, uh, and the way that it doesn't want to generalize itself out, it doesn't want to, uh, it doesn't want to reach uh, large abstract ideas, but rather stubbornly sort of uh, holds on to kind of local areas of, of, um, of research. Anyway, we know that, uh, that, that uh, at least on that level, uh, uh, he's very active politically, and the, one of the things that he's been most concerned with is, um, is with uh, the very conditions in prison, uh, and with uh, um, uh, prison reform uh, and with prison revolts uh, and so forth, uh, you don't, I, I understand, you're not allowed to visit prisons in France, but in this country uh, or in, this, in North America, he's visited uh, 
prisons in, in several places and, and had a lot of interviews with prisoners and went to Attica and so forth. So we know that in the background of, of, this, of this work on prisons is something which is a, a passionate uh, political position. Uh, this is also clearly a book about something which is uh, uh, which strikes deep chords in everybody, and which we associate with uh, with uh, with domination and with power and brutality and so forth. Uh, and yet, when you open it, what are the images that one sees? Well, this this one. I don't know if you can see these things. Uh, here are some leaves, plates from a book on military. Uh, art that is to say not war but military exercises you know how you parade and so forth um, here are some buildings what are these doing in here well, prisons no doubt but they're not all prisons uh, here is penmanship what's that doing in here? then we have um, schools All of these, uh, none of these are illustrations of events. Uh, they're all, uh, they're all uh, plates of one kind or another which show us here is the, um, here's a, this is a project for the building of a prison. Uh, here is Bentham's Panopticon. We'll have more to say about that in a minute. And finally, uh, more buildings, more buildings. Uh, Finally, we have this, a tree being corrected. Um, well, uh, that already, I think, uh, alerts us to, the, um, to, to something um, unusual in the way this investigation will uh, unfold. Now, this said, uh, I have to then also go on to admit that the book opens with something as, um, as horrifying as you would uh, want to read, namely the execution of Demiels, I think, in, uh, in, um, in, in 1757, the, the attempted assassin of Louis XV, which is surely, but like all of the other public executions in that period, one of the most grisly <coughs> kind of things in which uh, the, the, the victim is systematically tortured on the, on the, uh, on the place of execution in front of a public, uh, a very numerous public, and which finally he's torn apart by four horses and, and uh, drawn and quartered, burned, uh, everything else. Uh, this is, these are things, uh, I don't, the, the one, the one kind of really vivid example of this kind of public execution that I can remember in, uh, in literature is in, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a very long time since I read it, but it, it sort of adds on some of our own horror at this since it's the, the reaction of, uh, I think, of an English couple traveling in 19th century France where this is still being practiced. In The Old Wives' Tale, does anyone remember the, the execution scene in that, which is particularly Grizzly, or am I, am I just imagining? Maybe it's another book, but I think uh, that, that gives a kind of glimpse into what public executions still were at a certain point. That maybe must be a little earlier in the 19th century at, that, at the point at which that's, that story is told. Uh, at any rate, there's enough uh, violence and brutality there uh, uh, to, um, to last through the, the rest of the book. But the point that Foucault is trying to make uh, will be uh, again the one that I uh, that I um, that I underscored a moment ago, namely that uh, it would certainly seem as though uh, much had been realized in the uh, elimination of that kind of public uh, or private uh, brutality of of, uh, of uh, ca capital punishment. Uh, and, in, and its replacement by the, the relatively more humane uh, um, measures either of, uh, if it has to be capital execution, of, of the guillotine and of, uh, of a private execution, uh, or indeed of imprisonment when it's a question of things which in the, uh, you know, in, uh, in uh, earlier uh, ancien regime societies were published by, uh, by death like uh, theft and, and things of that kind. So it would certainly seem that uh, modern liberal society has something to congratulate itself on uh, in the elimination 
uh, of these practices. Um, I think that we can't, we don't want to suggest uh, that Foucault doesn't think that it was a good thing, that it is a good thing that there aren't public executions of that kind anymore. They, they seem to be coming back in some places. But, um, uh, but rather that this is a historical dialectic. That is, the fact that there's something monstrous in a public execution uh, does not necessarily mean that uh, there's anything less monstrous in what, um, in what replaced it. Now, the difference uh, here is that uh, from, uh, this, from the scheme of the earlier books, as I outlined them to you, is that here Foucault uh, is inclined to say, yes, there was a liberal prison reform, it was a co coherent theory, but the problem was that it was never applied. So here he's not saying there was ancien regime mode of thinking, which is now replaced by a new mode of dealing with, uh, say, the insane, a bourgeois mode of thinking. He's saying really that there are three positions. There was that of the ancien regime, public execution. Uh, there is that projected by the reformers, and it's very interesting, and we'll look at that in a minute. And then there's that mode of imprisonment which actually emerged so that the thought of the reformers remained a dead letter. And indeed, Foucault says, although it was very varied, it was a science system in its own right, uh, it was certainly ideological, and so on and so forth, nonetheless, it was flattened out, and the only thing that, uh, that, that uh, was uh, retained of this, um, of this newer, of this new mutation in injustice is simple imprisonment, which is then the answer for everything. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense, uh, Foucault here in the new book is willing to make a kind of distinction between the ideology of a system, the way a system tries to think itself or imagine itself or project itself, and what it actually does. And I think this is already something quite, uh, quite different for, for him. And obviously it's possible because now he's investigating practices or what the French call pratique, which is a useful uh, term, uh, rather than... Um, epistemological structures rather than pure thought. Uh, because in the realm of pure thought, obviously, um, everything you're going to deal with is going to remain within the system, right? That is, uh, another thought will also be a thought. Whereas if one can make distinctions between how people actually are in prison and the thinking about prisons which obtain a certain period, then at once a distance opens up, which, is, uh, which allows one to, um, to analyze uh, these things in ideological terms. Now, uh, I want to look then at the, this. Um, <coughs> so, so, um, so the book will essentially turn around this problem. It will say, not really why did the, um, why did the older modes of torture and public execution disappear, that's never really answered as such. But why did this mode of imprisonment <coughs> take its place rather than the much more complicated system of uh, penal reform imagined by the, the reformers? The whole book will then undertake uh, to do this. And to do so, it will leave the whole question of prisons and go into other areas and then come back to them. So the structure of it is to set up the difference between these two modes of imprisonment and thinking about prisons then to try to look for the origins of this new quadrillage or new kind of programming system elsewhere in, in places which, uh, as these illustrations have already maybe suggested, which will include military discipline, education, uh, even writing as part of that, uh, and, and finally uh, a kind of new geographical organization of physical space. Uh, and only then, and, and modes of placing in writing one's experience, namely the examination and the investigation, that is in the continental sense, you know, where when a criminal is then, or a suspect is summoned to the juge d'instruction, they take down whole sets of things and put it in the dossier and so on. Uh, uh, those two new modes of placing uh, what, what, uh, what the ethno, um, uh, what the ethnomethodologists call precisely ethnomethodology, that is how you tell, uh, how you put in words your practices, what you actually do, uh, those new modes of 
placing in language uh, um, uh, the practices of daily life, all of those things will then be this, the, the material for this long detour that Foucault makes in order to come back to prisons and show why the modern prison comes into being. So we have something which is clearly not a, a causal description, but it's a way of conveying the uh, nature of the emergence of this new thing, one of whose monuments will also be the modern prison. And this new thing we've been able to call already, uh, but it's not clear just with how much justification we've been able to describe in the image terms of, uh, of the grid work. So we know already that uh, what's happened is, has been that the older sacred space and the older way of experiencing the body has given way to a new organization of space, that of the grid, uh, in which the body is seized and in which the body is dealt with in a different way than it was in the old, uh, in, in the old world. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> our, uh, but this is not a causal description. That is, we don't, we're not told why this came about, but we're merely, um, we're merely given other areas, the description of other areas in which this change has come about and in which its, its quality or its, how can I say, existential um, uh, 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 feeling uh, is maybe more directly accessible to us than, uh, than, in, uh, than in prisons. Um, okay, so, so this is, uh, so this is a, a narrative again. It's the story of how something new came into being. Uh, and it would seem that that something new is pretty easy to identify. It's new, new prisons. But when we start, start to think about that, uh, we find that even that's not so clear. Does he mean new prison buildings, new institutions? And indeed, what is an institution? New experiences of imprisonment, new, um, new types of control. But what is this thing uh, of which we're telling the story. So the first, uh, the first uh, problem raised by the narrative analysis of historiography uh, is uh, the, the nature of the, the, the basic object of the narrative. Right? Uh, and this is a problem which, which emerges the minute that you, you cease to think of history in terms of characters, that is kings and queens, chronicle history and so on, uh, and you begin to, to talk in terms of total transformations. Because at that point, suddenly, if the truth is the whole, right? If this great transformation, which is the emergence of the modern world, is a kind of total thing, then how can you get at it? Uh, you can no longer tell the story of any one of these objects, for one thing, because it's, that's not the complete story, and for another thing, because these objects disappear in front of your eyes, if you want to call them institutions, suddenly you don't know what that means anymore. What's an institution? Is it the building? Is it the way people live in it? Is it what, what another class of people use it for? Is it a set of laws, written texts? What is it? it so the, the very entity that you thought you were describing falls to pieces in front of your eyes. There isn't anything like that anymore. And now you have to invent an entity. An entity. You have to produce an entity to, to make this story uh, perceptible, to make this change uh, perceptible. Uh, now, uh, let me just see how we're doing here. Uh, this is, uh, this, tomorrow we'll try to see how this problem is not uh, without analogy to what's going on in Flaubert. Uh, I, I tried to say that, uh, that, the, the, that the three tales of Flaubert were about history, but tried to tell history uh, precisely in this problematical way. That is, it's something which is never present. Uh, and tried to invent a way of dealing with history. Uh, and both making, making it present, uh, but, uh, but by inventing something uh, to, 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 uh, to convey that presence through a necessary absence. Since history is never, uh, is never there at any one moment. It seems to me, therefore, that this is that these are analogous problems. Uh, the problem of how to tell a narrative about a thing which is, uh, uh, which is in its very structure absent, or which is total, and which is therefore never present to you in any kind of, um, uh, in any kind of tangible form. Um, uh, so, so this is something that, that we want to watch uh, happening in, in Foucault. Now, essentially, um, 
we already know the, 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 the first level thematics of this book. I mentioned uh, that this is a contribution to this uh, investigation of the, of the political uh, technology of the body. And thus, we know that the body will be one of the, one of the characters uh, in this story. Uh, and the fate of the body will be one of the themes which will allow us to identify uh, this transformation as we watch what happens to it. Uh, now, here I think the, the description of the public execution is very, very rich and essentially um, what Foucault's idea is that this is, uh, the, these public executions are, uh, must be um, visible ways of demonstrating the power of the monarch or the sovereign on the body of the criminal. Uh, and so for Foucault, his, uh, there's a book by Kantorowicz called uh, the, the King's Body, which is, which is referred to here. It's a, his analysis of the body of the, the tortured or the, uh, the executed criminal uh, is in a kind of structural pendant to the, to the divine body, which is that uh, uh, which is the center of space and of the compass and, and, and so on. And what the king uh, is doing through the mode of public execution is restoring the power which was, uh, which was um, um, uh, threatened by the, or undermined by the, uh, by the activity uh, uh, of the criminal. So the criminal is not, as will be the case later on, understood as being a deviant or a delinquent from a norm which is that of non-criminality. Rather, the criminal is someone who offends the king. Uh, and there isn't any suggestion of normality or abnormality, it's just something different. It's a different relationship of, uh, of the, the other, of this mode of otherness to, uh, to the structure of, of things. Okay, let me just try to read you uh, a, a, a passage in which uh, Foucault uh, <coughs> tries to convey this sense of the transformation which takes place when you move from the public execution to the imprisonment and apparent uh, retraining or whatever of the modern criminal in a prison. Uh, it's a, this is a displacement in the, in the mechanics of the example, that is the example to which the criminal is put publicly. <coughs> In the, penal, in the penal system of, of, uh, of torture, the example is the exact uh, replica of the crime. Uh, there, was, there was a kind of uh, twin uh, manifestation, uh, which uh, was to show the crime and at the same time the, the power of the sovereign, which mastered this crime. So, for example, in that sense, a, a thief would symbolically have a hand cut off because that's part of the, both the representation of the crime and then the, the king's punishment of it. Uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a penal system calculated uh, on its own effects, and this is, um, uh, this is now moder the modern penal system or the modern theory of the penal system, the example must also uh, uh, allude to the crime, but in the most discreet way possible. It must indicate the intervention of power, but with the greatest economy, and in the ideal case, it, must, it is there in order to prevent the, re, the, the later reapparition of the one and the other, both of the crime and of the, uh, and of the example. The example is no longer, in modern justice, a ritual which manifests, it is a sign, and a sign which tries to block or to be an obstacle to repetition. Um, through this technique of punitive signs, and here uh, he goes through a whole series of <coughs> descriptions, at least in the theory of the penal reformers, of how the, the punishment should suit the crime in this famous expression. That is, how there should be even a calculus of punishments. And uh, each crime should be kind of uh, coded and reanalyzed and then re, uh, re, uh, reinvented in the form of the, of the punishment. And this is a way of, I think, seeing uh, the difference between the penal reform and the actual uh, results the, the, of modern imprisonment. I, according to the theory of penal reform, there would therefore be a multiplicity of possible punishments, right? And this qualitative variety of punishments will correspond to the qualitative variety of crimes. In fact, in modern prisons, there's just one punishment, which is imprisonment. I mean, 
what are the, d the degrees of it don't matter, uh, uh, the, 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 the freedom or the, the solitary confinement of the, the, the way the cell is organized. That's really not this, that's no longer this ideal of qualitative variety that the penal reformers had in mind. So that's a good way of understanding uh, this, this distinction. Um, through this technique of punitive signs, which tends to invert the entire temporal field of, of penal action, the reformers uh, believe that they can give the, the, the power uh, of punishment uh, an economic and efficient and generalizable uh, instrument that can be used throughout the, bo the social body, um, the body of society, susceptible of coding all, uh, all of... Um, all behavior, and thus reducing the whole diffuse domain of what Foucault calls I illegalisms. The semiotechnique uh, with which uh, the penal reformers try to uh, equip the, the power of punishment uh, rests on five or six basic rules, and he gives these rules. So this is almost a grammar of punishment, uh, of, 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 um, uh, of, the, uh, of the semiotics of the punishment of the body in, in modern, um, uh, in modern um, societies. Now, um, I want to read one more section, and maybe that will, I think that's about all I have time for today. Um, Well, I'll, I'll, I think I'll keep this uh, for next time. The point, uh, then, is that uh, we have um, uh, in this book, and, and uh, uh, we have a, an initial, uh, we have a, a matter of twofold interest for us. On the one hand, we have in the content of this work <coughs> a fresh description of what the, this great transformation might be what this process of rationalization might be, which, of which we'll see other versions in Adorno and Horkheimer and Lukács, Weber, and so on. Uh, a description of, therefore, something which they call rationalization, which Foucault approaches in a different way. Uh, I want to argue, when we come to the literary text, that there's a very clear relationship between the emergence of modern literary, literary forms and this basic experience of the desacralized world, the rationalized world, the, the, the world of grid work uh, as it's described here. And that this relationship is partly one of, of uh, reflection and partly one of compensation. That is that they're both uh, positive and negative relationships. Alongside of this interest in the content of a book like this, we're also, we also want to see how, it, how such a process could ever be put into language. That is, we want to see uh, this book as a novel, which would attempt to write on the kind of collective, uh, uh, on a kind of collective level, the history of the emergence of modern society, and which would have to invent a whole series of techniques, literary techniques, figurative techniques, techniques of, of figuration, to, to tell this narrative, which otherwise can't be told because it's so global and vast. So those are the two uh, areas that we will deal with uh, uh, next uh, time and uh, hopefully uh, confronting them with, uh, with uh, the dialectic of enlightenment uh, and we'll deal with this in a somewhat different way uh, tomorrow morning. Let me add uh, several things. First, that I've put a number of uh, articles on our, in our reserve in the complete department, uh, things uh, of my own that I may have occasion to refer to. Uh, and therefore, that might complete or, or uh, fill out some of these some of these things. So you can uh, look at those uh, there. Um, uh, and then um, I wanted to also say that of the various books that we've ordered, the Deleuze Guattari, the Anti Oedipus, has finally been been printed and uh, and has arrived in the bookstore in uh, Miller's. Uh, where, unfortunately, since it's a bound uh, book, it's uh, on the order of, what, 18 or $19. Dollars. But uh, it is there, and uh, we, but I think we probably will not uh, get to it this term, but we'll begin on it maybe in January. Hmm? So you can get it as a Christmas present. Right? <laughs>